Mm. So back to gauge theory, yeah. gauge symmetry. What the hell is that? All right. Well, here's the here's the craziest thing. Okay. There is a very confusing visual image of the fundamental unit that you need to appreciate what gauge symmetry is all about. And uh, I had Jamie load it up um, under the tab called Planet Hopf. And this is going to be- H-O-P-F? H-O-P-F. What the fuck am I looking at? You are looking at the most important object in the universe. What? That looks like some uh, trippy screensaver on your laptop. Take another puff, my friend, because it's <laughs> worth it. Uh, this is what you're looking at is a principal fiber bundle. And it's uh, and it is the, the earth. Those are the continents well, I'm that's, looking at. That's the cool part about it, which is this is very confusing to figure out what you're looking at, but it's finite. In other words, if we stay for an hour or two on this and we actually answer all your questions, you will actually know what a principal bundle is and you will know the arena in which gauge theory exists. For folks at home that are just listening and they well, what the fuck are these guys talking about? What is the name of this video, Jamie? It's not a video. It's a small file on a page. I typed in Planet Hopf, and it was the first thing that showed up on math.toronto.edu. Okay, it's so an extended thing. Planet H O P F yeah. for anybody who wants to look at this. If you're just listening and you have no idea why I'm freaking out, so um, this this was done by a, a friend of mine named Dror Barnaton. I actually coded the same thing up. Um, strangely enough, didn't do a, a, as brilliant a job of coloring it. And this looks amazing, by the way. So, okay. What you're looking at is a two-dimensional sphere that is the surface of the Earth where an extra circle is included at every point on the surface of that sphere, which you're now visualizing. And that extra circle, which would be called the fiber, um, when you take the totality of all of those circles together, one for each point on the surface of the sphere, they create something called a three sphere. That is all the points that are one unit of distance away from the origin in four dimensional space. So that three dimensional sphere is the analog of a two dimensional sphere sitting in three dimensional space. So think about a caramel apple. If you've ever made caramel apples, you get a disc of caramel and you wrap it around the sphere that is the apple surface, right? So this is the three-dimensional version of caramel wrapped around the three-dimensional uh, sphere sitting in four-dimensional space. Now- Do you understand any of this, Jamie? I'm trying. Well, look, okay, dude, it's totally you. trippy, right? Yeah, and it's, so it's, we're not gonna get it completely during this session. However- well, what, I, I think I lack the tools. I don't think so. We lack the time. So mm. the first thing is you are finding out that one of your friends thinks this is the most important object in the universe and you've never even heard of it. Right. Much less know that there's one visual example. What so the fuck? How's this happening now? I know, mm. exactly. <laughs> it does look fucking crazy. Well, okay. This is what was discovered in the mid-1970s as the connection between mathematics and different, what we call differential geometry and the discipline of particle theory. So two guys, uh, Jim Simons, the world's, now the world's most successful hedge fund manager and C.N. Yang, a person who might ar arguably be the world's first or second greatest living theoretical physicist, had a lunch seminar and they said, why don't we figure out how do we talk to each other? And what they found out is they both had developed a version of this picture. And independently, the, independently. So it was the Rosetta Stone that unleashed a revolution. So when Lawrence Krauss was talking to you about gauge theory, he, he was saying things about chessboards and you color it white and you color it black. It's super confusing to me. I would rather your people be confused about an actual example of the object on which we do gauge theory that you can visually see. Mm. Right. Now, if I started to tell you what gauge theory is, it's pretty simple. So here's a, here's a description I never hear anyone say. When you're doing differential calculus, I don't know if you remember differential calculus, you're trying to figure out the slopes of lines, mm -hmm. the ro instantaneous rise over the run. So 
that always makes sense to people. Okay, I figure out how fast it's going up versus how fast it's going across. But a question arises, which is, where do you measure the rise from? So for example, if I say, what is the height of Mount Everest? Jamie will say? 30, what is it, 35,000? Yeah, something like that. Something crazy like that, well, right? Let's just go 1,000 and say base. Well, let's go get an internet connection. Yeah, 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 let's yeah. take a guess. What do you think it is? I don't know. I can't remember. I want to say it's 35,000. What do you think? I thought it was 29. Or... 29029. No. Oh. Okay. What's uh, the highest? What's the highest one? Is it K2? No, no K2 is second, right? Is it? Yeah. Is Everest the highest? Yeah. But okay, so okay. Everest. So 29, would you say 29? 29029. 029. Above what? Sea level? Okay. Where is Mount Everest located? The Himalayas. What Tibet? C, what sea? Uh, there's no ocean there, sir. <laughs> right. So, right. like, we snuck in. It's above sea level, and there's no right. ocean. So we start from the center of the Earth. We have this structure called the geoid, which is the interpolation of sea level as if sea level, as if the Earth was only ocean and there was no tide. Right. And as if there's some sort of a... So we snuck in the reference level. That's my point, is, is that we, mm. we teach these kids to repeat why it's 29,000 and change above sea level, and there's no sea. Right. So that reference level is the magic of gauge theory, right? Which is that we measure the rise over the run based mm -hmm. on a custom level. So a, a level that we all agree upon. So for example, let's imagine that you and I are in some country experiencing hyperinflation, right? And I'm your boss. And you say, dude, I need a raise. I say, well, look, I I've told you I would hire you for you know, 10,000 dinars a month. And you say, yeah. I say, well, your, your salary is constant. I took the derivative of it. I've paid you 10000 last month, 10000 this month. So you're getting the same amount. Derivative equals zero. It's constant salary. Now you have to come back at me in calculus. And you say, no, I don't like your notion of the derivative because what you're doing is you're measuring the absolute number of dinars that you're paying me. But what I want to do is I want to measure it in purchasing power because I'm losing money every month that you don't increase my salary. So uh. I now come up with a version of the calculus in which my salary is not constant because it's being measured uh, relative to purchasing power rather than absolute units. That's gauge theory, is that you're bringing in a reference level that does the differentiation. So you, you're measuring rise over run by customizing the problem. So these were two different applications of the calculus. Mm -hmm. The cheating employer says, I want to go with constant dinars. The gifted employee says, not so fast. I, I know gauge theory. I want to use a custom reference level, which is purchasing power. Right? So it's like sneaking the geoid into Tibet to measure Everest. I've got my custom level. Does this make sense to you? Yes. It makes sense, right? Yes. But now explain it. Say what he said. Uh, well, I mean, we would need a new reference of what we're, what you want to measure, what would, like a new conversation to have a, right. a, like a flat level. Right, right. I guess. Yeah. It would be really difficult for me to recall a day from now. Maybe. Lay, lay yeah. off the weed. No, it's not the <laughs> weed. That might help. It's a la no, the weed might help. <laughs> yeah, right? it might recall better. might pop a mushroom cap, see what's up. It's, um, it's still in reference to quantum physics, like how you would use yeah. gauge symmetry. Well, but let's, you would... let's look at some more cool stuff okay. with the visual cortex, because everything that we can do visually should inform what we can do linguistically. So you should push everything into the visual realm that you can. Uh, in what order... do you mean by that? Like, Well, they're... I just showed you the hop vibration, which is the only, in some sense, the only mature picture I can show you of a principal vibration in geometry or physics that is honest and has the full complexity. It's got a certain kind of knottedness to it. It's got something that we would call curvature and it is visualizable. And so it would be better that we spent, you know, a day or two on this most important object, which we think reality is based around and that you visually got comfortable with it. And then you said, okay, now tell me again what gauge symmetry is. And then instead of Lawrence talking about this chessboard and the colors and all this stuff by analogy, you'd actually be seeing gauge theory visually. Like I could program a computer and have done so to show you visually what a gauge theory is. And it takes some time to 
sort of understand what the trippy pictures are. But if, let's bring up the Escher staircase. And Jamie has a nice wrinkle on this that instead of using MC Escher's staircase, he's got this animated guy who just keeps going down. Mm. All right. Now, what's going on with those stairs? Now, those stairs are sort of an optical illusion because obviously it can't just keep going down. But then you build these systems like rock, paper, scissors. What's the best thing to throw in rock, paper, scissors? Well, it depends on what you throw. Well, but we should be able to agree that rock is better than scissors. Rock is better than scissors, scissors. but paper is better than rock. Right. So you go around that thing, and now the the point is that you get to, like, rock is much better than rock. Right? And that that seems crazy. Now, that concept would be what we would call holonomy. The weird sentence, rock is better than rock because of that going around the loop. Why rock is better than rock? I don't get it. Well, rock rock is is better better than than scissors. Scissors Scissors is better than paper. Right. Paper is better than rock. So by transitivity, rock is therefore better than rock because you went around the loop and came back to rock. It's like MMA math. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you're you're changing uh, currencies and you don't spend any of it because you keep using your credit card, by the time you come home, you had more money than when you left because the exchange rates did some things so that when you changed into each currency, you, you, you somehow got richer. But by saying rock is better than rock, you're denying the fact they're exactly the same. I, well, no. That's, you're, not, that, you're not addressing it. You just want to continue that's the, linguistic, the same. That's right. the linguistic fallacy, right. right? So the idea that this system here, so those stairs in, in gauge theory would be these reference levels for the derivative. Mm-hmm. And you can have situations where the reference levels don't knit flatly together. Right. Mm -hmm. And so by virtue of that, we would say that the system has curvature. Curvature is the Escherness of of these better than transitive statements. What we're looking at, folks, for people who are just listening, we're looking at if you've never seen those Escher uh, etches, those sketches, they're very strange because what there are is a bunch of staircases that appear to always be going downhill, even if one of them is above the other one. It's very strange. Very strange. And this one, we're watching an animated guy roll down this staircase constantly, even though it really looks like somehow or another it must go up somewhere, but you don't ever see it going up. But it's also a factor of the illusion of perspective and how it's drawn and and you know, playing games with lines. Exactly. But if you do this very weird experiment, which we didn't know about until the late 50s, called the Aronoff-Bohm experiment, um, if you run um, a uh, electric uh, current through a wire that's insulated, um, it's, it appears not to have any electromagnetic field outside uh, of the insulation. However, if you do some sort of quantum interference experiment, you can tell that there's current going through because it affects the phase phase shift, let's say, of an electron orbiting that insulated electromagnetic system. So nobody thought that that was going to happen because they thought, well, an insulator would keep – we thought the electromagnetic field is what determines the shift in the electron. But it's insulated, so there is no electromagnetic field to worry about. It turned out that it wasn't the electromagnetic field alone. It was some previous geometric concept, which was called the electromagnetic potential, that determined something about the phase shift. So this Escher staircase, in the case of electromagnetism, it's like the photons are the analog of those steps. They're partially what determine the derivative operators, these reference levels, and again, in, in our discussion of the Uh, Am I paying you the right amount in a hyperinflationary economy? So all of these things, you're trying to figure out, well, that's an optical illusion, but that effect actually occurs in some systems, not as an optical illusion. Yes, right? So this weirdness um, requires a fair amount in terms of either study of math or learning visualizations. But there's no way to achieve it in my experience with linguistic communications like all the stuff that gets said about you know the universe is expanding or let me tell you what a gauge theory is and and what there's a reason it's confusing it's because it doesn't make any effing sense right i see what you're saying sort of but so this is this is like what Feynman said if you think you know quantum physics you don't know quantum physics well there's there's some of that like there's you know, one of the most important things in the world is this thing called a spinner. 
like the electrons and the protons, correspond to things called spinners. And the average person has no idea that spinners exist. What's more, spinners have a property that when I tell it to you linguistically, won't make any sense. All right, I'm okay. good. So let's do this with coffee. Hit me with it. Yeah. Okay. So Once more? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Perfect. Okay. All right. Now, here's the problem. Okay. Hold your cup. No. Sorry. From the bottom. All right. And here's the first challenge. Without spilling it, okay. I want you, and without readjusting your grip on the bottom of your cup, I want you to turn your cup 360 degrees. No, no, no. Uh, sorry. Turn your, your finger should not change on the cup. Oh, okay. Turn the cup 360 degrees without spilling it and try to take a sip. Okay. That, that didn't work. No. Now, without coming back, <laughs> how would you take a sip? If I got it all the way around that way? Yeah. Mr. Um, Jiu-Jitsu Man. I would have to... I would have to help myself. Yeah, no, no. You're going to do it? All right, you ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Okay. Oh, so you're going to go around I'm a circle? Do 360. Okay. Right. Now, I'm screwed if I don't bring it back underneath. Oh, I see. So that system required 720 degrees of rotation unexpectedly. Oh, you just keep going. Right. Okay. Now, the idea that there are objects that don't come back to themselves under 360 degrees of rotation but require 720 is probably something you've never thought about before in your life. Right. But without that, you wouldn't have the Pauli exclusion principle. You wouldn't have the stability of matter. And this thing is called the Philippine wine dance. Jamie, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> That's not very seductive, Joe. It seems like some very odd ethnic dance. Yeah, but like maybe you could do 11th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. Here we go. So this spinner is one of the coolest, most important objects anywhere. And it was discovered to be important in physics by a guy named Paul Dirac. Right? It's fun. Okay, so this 720 theory is entirely responsible for the world that we live in. This is so bizarre to and watch no, this in animation. And nobody knows about it, right? Like, unless you're hanging out with physicists, they don't tell you that electromagnetism has to do with the fact that there's a secret circle at every point in space and time that's invisible to you. They don't tell you that there's stuff that requires 720 degrees of rotation. They just say mind-blowing stuff about... Whoa. So what is happening in the 720 degrees of rotation in the quantum world? There's an object that is requiring this just the way the cup arm system requires 720 degrees of rotation. What object is this? It's called a spinner. And that spinner is how we model the electron, the neutrino, quarks. All that is spinorial matter. Sir. That's a good long pause. I like it. Yeah. And wh where does this fit in in our model of the universe? Like, what is the function of this? Why is it there? What is it? How do we know it's there? Well, we know it's there um, because uh, when Dirac – so there was this problem with, like, the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation takes one derivative in terms of the direction of time – and takes two derivatives in the direction of all the spatial directions. But because Einstein told us that space and time are woven together, for the theory to be relativistic, you need the same number of derivatives of time as of space, because space-time is sort of one kind of semi-unified object. All right, that means you either have to boost the number of derivatives of time up to two to match the two t derivatives in the directions of space, or you have to knock the two direct derivatives in the spatial directions down to one derivative to get it to be equal. Now, one direction gets you to something called the Klein-Gordon equation. What Dirac did is he took a square root of the Klein-Gordon equation to get these spinners. So he had these numbers. He didn't understand at first that he was going to get kicked into this world of spinners. He came up with a square root equation in which A times B, thought to be numbers, was not equal to B times A. It was like equal to the negative of B times A. So it was like what two numbers, when, when you multiply them, matter in which order? It wasn't numbers. It was matrices. So this was one of the great insights, you know, rival to Einstein in terms of the depth of what it told us about the universe. 
Most of us haven't really heard of Paul Dirac. We don't realize that he has one of the three most important equations in physics. Now, in, when you say three most important, important in how it's applicable to everyday life or important in how it's given us an understanding in quantum physics or important how its, understand, it, it's, it's understanding is, is significant to quantum physics. We're talking about our... We're talking about bedrock reality. Like you and I are having a conversation, and if you're a Matrix fan, and what we might call the construct. Okay. What is the construct made of? It's made so the way I do it is I, I think of it as a newspaper story. There's where and when did it happen. There was who and what was involved, and there's how and why. Okay. So where and when is space and time clearly. The who and the what. To me, let's say the who is the spinorial stuff. It's like electrons, it's protons, neutrons, quarks, the stuff that we're made of. And then you and I are only able to see each other because we're passing photons back and forth, which are force particles. They're not spinorial. They, they come back to themselves after 360 degrees. They don't require 720. So this is sort of the... You know, if you were going to go to a play, you'd have the, the dramatic personnel of the play given to you at the beginning. So this is what this universe is. It's a story about space and time, where and, where and when, about what is in that, you know, like who are the players and what equipment are they using? That's like bosons and fermions. And then there's the how and the why, which is the equations and the Lagrangians that 